angels. What are they? Do they exist? Is there really such a thing as angels? What do angels do? We hear of encounters that are supernatural, uh, car accidents where an angel picks up a car and lifts it off a person saving their life and then disappears. Let's talk today about what are angels. Welcome to Legacy TV. I'm Noni Tanner. Today I'm honored to have my sister, my special guest, Reverend D. Tanner. She and I are going to be talking about angels today. Yeah, great subject. Great subject, isn't it? And a huge subject, and we certainly don't know the half of it. We know what we've experienced, what we've learned from other people's testimonies, and what we read in the Word. But I think in this day that we're living in, there's a much bigger manifestation, a larger manifestation that God is increasing our knowledge of the presence of angels in our situations working in our behalf. I believe that's true. Yes. More and more we hear of that <laughs> and uh, we probably have angels working in our everyday life that we're not even aware of. Exactly. <laughs> And you know, growing up, I'm sure you know we had. Everyone has uh, situations that arise where, you know, later that when you think about it, that the, an angel had to have intervened, whether we were aware of their presence or had our spiritual eyes open to see them or not. Um, we just know that God intervened in our behalf. I had an experience like that some years ago. I was on my way to the state board meeting uh, in North Dakota of Women's Aglow. And uh, on my way there, almost to Fargo, my car started fishtailing. It was a beautiful day. The roads were perfectly clear. It had rained the night before, but everything was clear, sunny, bright. And I re reached over to grab my map because I was going to be turning uh, somewhere to go to this little town of Rugby, North Dakota, Rugby. where the yeah, where the meeting was, uh, and. Um, when I did that, I must have jerked the wheel just a little bit, and it caused the car, my darling little Nissan, to fishtail a little bit, and then it went more and more and more, until all of a sudden, I could see the back end of my car coming right up along the side. Then I hit the median on this highway, which was a very wide median with a, a big dip in it. It was very grassy. Everything went into a time lapse or time warp, and it seemed like uh, my thinking was very different than, than it normally was. All I could do was cry out, Jesus, 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 because I'm having a car accident, and the thought occurred to me. So this is how fast accidents happen. I hit the grass in the median, and uh, my car was plowing in it, and I saw that I was going to be hitting this huge culvert, a cement culvert. My little car would have been smashed. I probably would have been killed. I had six children home at the time and they needed a mama and calling out to Jesus. And all of a sudden, at the very last second, my car spun around, did a 360. So now I'm turning the other way and the ignition actually turned off. Amazing. <laughs> to yeah. me, it had to be an, an angel yeah. who was working Definitely. in my behalf. Um, <clears throat> and I sat there for a minute and took stock. I was stunned. And I marveled that the car ignition was actually turned off because I hadn't touched it. I was yeah. holding onto that wheel for dear life, yeah. trying to yeah. make it stabilize. Yeah. And uh, I thought, am I hurt? And I thought, my leg hurts a little bit from hitting the shift because I had a floor shift. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but other than that, no. And then I thought, does the car still work? So I put my hand over it, realizing that it was actually shut off, the ignition is off, turned the key on, started the car, and I thought, okay, the car still works. Now what to do? Is, you're almost on, uh, on automatic, yeah, right. <laughs> taking inventory. So I drove up and pulled back, turned totally around, pulled back to be going in the correct direction. Mm. And uh, 
then I shut the car off and I thought, okay, I'm going to see if there's any damage to the car. Well, I'd been out about maybe two minutes and my legs are shaking and uh, I wasn't out more than two minutes and I realized, you know, I have a flat tire on one side with grass sticking out between the rim and the tire itself when a truck came along with emergency road helpers. Hi, do you need any help? Yeah. And of course I did. Yeah. They put my spare tire on uh, my little donut. tiny one. Yeah, donut. And uh, they said, well, uh, they'd take care of uh, getting my tire to this shop, you know, just follow them. And, and I did, and uh, everything was taken care of. But I believe it was a divine encounter. Oh, yeah. It was intervention. <laughs> <laughs> and in Hebrews it says that you know ask who are the men who are the angels and their ministering spirits to uh, sent to minister to the heirs of salvation which is who we are and we have inherited his salvation that he provided and uh, as we elect to <laughs> and choose to so yeah I've had a couple of experiences uh, they were I'm sure they're more like I say that we don't even aren't even aware of because we didn't see an actual being or an angel of any kind. Um, but they were both instances where my children actually saw the angels, um, but I did not. But it involved me both times, mm -hmm. and uh, the first time is kind of a. Uh, turned out to be a joyous thing for me and something I never have forgotten. It was years ago, and we were at church and. Uh, dancing and worshiping God and dancing before the Lord and in the aisles and uh, my daughter who was about 11 at the time was across the room she wasn't sitting with me she was in the next section with her friends and she was up you know rejoicing in the Lord too and singing and all of a sudden I just had how old was she she was like 11 or 11 or 12 you know, something like that and uh, I'm just busy worshiping God and dancing and and uh, all of a sudden my eye kind of caught hers and she's over there in the next section and she's pointing at me going ha 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 laughing and very hard. I could tell oh. she was really laughing and I thought, ooh, you don't <laughs> laugh at somebody when they're worshiping God. You Not, thought she was being disrespectful. Right, because I thought, I'm sure I look funny. <laughs> uh, but it doesn't matter. The Lord doesn't think right. we look odd. He loves everything we do. Um, uh, when we're worshiping and <clears throat> uh, so I thought wait till I get her in the car I'll straighten her out well then after church you know we were talking and I said you know that no matter how somebody looks when they're worshiping God don't ever make fun and laugh at them like you did and point at me like that don't don't do that to people well she goes mom I wasn't laughing at you I was laughing so hard and I had tears too at the same time because there was an angel on each side of you, and whatever movements you did, they were doing. Wow, that is incredible. <laughs> well, it's encouraging, too, because oh, sometimes yes. we're afraid to just step out and, and express our joy and our love for the Lord and our praise for the Lord because we're self-conscious, because we're not uh, dancing for the stars or with the stars or whatever it is. I'm not a dancer type of person, but when I worship God, I just have to use my body. And... Uh, so it was good to know. It was something I've always remembered because um, uh, I just know that any, well, any movement that you do in worship, it causes a reaction in the spirit. And so uh, I think it's awesome. You never know how God is answering prayers when we worship him. Yeah. Um, it's pleasing to him and he'll move heaven and earth for us. But that was a good lesson. Oh, it's marvelous. And dancing and worshiping God is a type of warfare, actually, in the yes, spirit. It is. Yes, it it's is. It's a very powerful thing. Yes. Yeah. You know, it took us a lot of years. It took Dee and I a lot of years to even learn how to really worship. We exactly. were grown up in, in Lutheran and Baptist churches, which was wonderful. We learned right. the scripture. You got saved. Uh, yes, born again and uh, baptized and... Um, many marvelous things, but we hadn't really learned how to worship God. I mean, it would be like, um, you know, welcoming uh, you into church, and then you have the announcements and two or three songs of the offertory, 
and uh, in the sure. sermon, and then another song, and you, you leave. And I love those old songs. Right. You know, well, trust and obey, oh, and all goodness, those. Yeah. You know, uh, I come to the garden alone. I love that. Yes. But what I we learned later, as uh, we grew in the Lord, is that we could come to Him and just really get lost in His presence yeah. when we were worshiping Him. Yeah. We heard about uh, a move of God that was deeper than what we had. And uh, we were very curious. And sometimes we would go to this fellow's house, a marvelous man of God named Jesse Graham. And Jesse and his wife, Annie, and I, they had a lot of children. Ten. Ten children, and they all worshiped God. I remember the first time I went, I was so shocked because somebody was on the conga drums sitting in the stairway. It was right. a home they meeting. up the stairs. Yes. We were sitting playing uh, tambourines. And, and Harold Graham was uh, playing piano mm -hmm. and uh, like a jazz pianist, and mm -hmm. I'd never heard anything like this before. I was just amazed. But uh, we would sing and sing and sing, worshiping God. We'd actually just forget about who was next to us and just be concentrating on the Lord in, and uh, worshiping Him and singing the same song over and over and over until we actually would just get in the spirit of it mm -hmm. and lifting up the Lord. <laughs> and uh, uh, did you say at one time that you had recorded uh, right. Some of that singing? Yeah, I had the old-fashioned tape recorder going, and uh, we that night we sang What a Mighty God We Serve. It's just a little four-liner uh, worship chorus, and we sang it over 38 times. <laughs> and uh, I, I know because we lived a great distance, and I was listening to the tape while I was driving home in the night, and... Uh, so I counted and got to, I just thought, I wonder how many times we sang that song, but how awesome, because the presence of God was there. He was pleased, and he doesn't care how many times you sing a song, but he does care when you get up in, in the spirit and worship him. So, exciting. The first time I ever felt the presence of God was at Becky's Cafeteria, about 1969 or 1970. And they were having meetings there mm -hmm. that uh, were quite incredible. And uh, we're worshiping God. And I, I just, I probably was visiting from North Carolina then when my husband was in uh, at Fort Bragg. So I was probably just visiting with you guys and you probably took me there. But I felt for the first time, my, my spirit felt high. It felt elongated and I thought, what is this? This is so strange to me. And I opened my eyes and yeah, it was still the same place, but I could feel my spirit just at a higher level. And a marvelous thing, you know, we started entering into the more supernatural things of God. Well, we hadn't been introduced to that before. No, not raised in that atmosphere. No. <clears throat> and uh, you can be sure that whenever that's going on, that the room is also filled with angels they rejoice right along with us because they continually worship their Lord and Maker, their Creator. Um, the one thing that I notice that people say is when someone passes away that loved God that they turn into an angel. And, you know, that's it sounds good, but you know, that's it's not kind of sweet accurate. and cutesy. It is, but it's not accurate because uh, God created us in such a manner that he, we're a separate, we're a human order. Angels can never, they're created beings uh, that he created uh, too, but they will, they're to assist us. And, uh, and so we're, we're no, we don't turn into an angel. No. Don't turn into an angel. We're, we're no, saints. they were a created being. Human beings were a created being. In fact, in, fact, in Psalms 8, verses 4 through 6, it says, What is a man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visited him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. So it's, it's showing us here in the scripture, David knew mm -hmm. that we are created a little lower than the angels. And yet we're not to worship angels, no. but we are aware of them. Yeah. And we're aware of them in our everyday life. Right. I was totally out of wood years ago. Um, I lived in the country. I was a young wife with four children home at that time, and it was starting to get cold. 
And my husband worked a uh, hundred miles away, so he stayed away during the week and uh, would be home on weekends a lot of times. Sometimes he did not come home on weekends. But so we were out there fending for ourselves. I, I, we were desperately poor. I had no telephone. I had no money. I had a car with a flat tire. I was stranded. I had no spare. And uh, I didn't know what to do because it was getting cold. And I had prayed about it and uh, just let go. And I went to sleep, tucked the children in nice and cozy. And the next morning I woke up hearing some thuds outside. And again, we're living in the country where it's quiet. The only noise you hear is a neighbor's dog barking occasionally or the birds or whatever. So I'm hearing this, these thuds and thunks on my, my porch. I jumped up and grabbed my robe, threw it on, and ran to my porch to see what's going on out there. Only in time to see the back end of a pickup leaving my driveway. A pickup mm. I didn't recognize, and I thought, that's odd, who was just here at my house? And uh, left a little trail of dust because it was dry. It was uh, probably uh, end of October, beginning of November. And so I opened the door to see what the thunks and thuds were. And here there was a bunch of firewood that had been thrown onto my porch. Mm. Well, interestingly, I had only heard a couple of thunks, maybe two, three, four. Uh, and uh, yeah, there was a whole cord of wood left mm. on my porch. I think it was a ministering spirit that came <laughs> delivering wood to me. I brought it in the house, uh, put it in the wood stove and started to fire up so that it would be warm by the time the kids woke up. But wow. it was really a blessing yeah. and a, a Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Yeah, exactly. He <laughs> heard your prayer and sent help. He did. He sent help. He does send help in our need. Time of need, he does send someone to minister to us um, in some way to minister to our need. And sometimes yeah, it's, it's people. Angels and sometimes it's yeah. people. Yeah. We just, and you didn't see anyone and you never and heard. And I never heard never who heard it was. Anyone. No one came and said, yeah. oh, did you get that wood? Yeah. Or, you know, it, it was really well, supernatural. It, it reminds me of a time <clears throat> a few years back when it was a, a big blizzard it had hit. And uh, I was out there trying to shovel. I lived with mom. We shared a home at that time. and. Uh, anyway, I was. I knew I was going to be out there all day. It was no was, man uh, in the house. No, no man in the house. The elderly was, mother. <clears throat> yeah, and so I was trying to shovel out, and I got just a little narrow. I'm starting up by the garage, and I got maybe a little path sideways. I'm going across this way, and uh, all of a sudden, this white truck with not a stitch of writing on it, uh, with a guy in it, he pulls up. He stopped at the driveway, and he beckoned for me to get out of the way. And I didn't know who it was, and I yeah. and I didn't know what he was going to do. But he pulled in, and in two or three tries, he just took his big plow and he got that whole driveway. And I ran, and Mom, we were going to grab some money to give him whoever he was. Yeah, you thought he probably did this as a business. He had a plow yeah, in the front of his truck. Yeah, a pickup with a plow, and. Um, uh, he did it so quickly. That's what was amazing. And by the time we got out there with the money, uh, he wouldn't. He said no. He gestured, and we held up money because he was now at the end of the driveway, and he just gestured no and took off. Now, I I never saw that truck. Uh, not that you see every truck that goes by, but you know if it was somebody local, you would have seen the person driving right. by. And he didn't stop and do anybody else's driveway. Wow. So I thought, you know, must be an angel. Yes. <laughs> or God sent someone as, to meet our desperate need that we had that right. day. Right. And so that was uh, another time. And like I say, I think there's times when we aren't aware of the presence of God at work in our lives. However, he chooses, whether it's a human or actually, you know, entertaining angels unawares because they sometimes they take on a human form to meet the yeah. need and to uh, work with us. Uh, also for protection, I should tell you the story about when, also when my kids were young, this was another time that I did not see uh, the actual things that they were seeing, demons and angels, and they were just little. They were like six and eight. We had gone to a county fair, a carnival, and it was now evening, dark. We were going to head home. We had about a 20-some mile trip, so I stopped to get gas right on the edge, and the freeway was right this was right off the freeway 
And uh, and I got out to to tell you how long ago it was. I had one of those old cars where the license plate was in the back, uh, of course, and you tip it down, and there was a gas oh. uh, tank right, right there under the plate. Well, when I did that and I put the hose in, I saw to the corner of my eyes. I uh, saw someone coming towards me, and it was very, very scary-looking person. Oh, a guy that uh, had you know horrible Megadeth the shirts on, and before Michael Jackson's time this was he had the black gloves on with the fingers and yeah. he, he had long and he had long dark hair and he just looked spooky i knew that it was something of the devil that and he was coming straight towards me and so i just turned to my pump and i turned back to the car and proceeded to pump gas and i just said out loud feeling lucky punk go ahead and make my day <laughs> <laughs> Only because I knew that I had God's protection. So, right. what, you know, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And so he walked straight up to me and he's, he wanted to ride because the freeway being oh. right there, he wanted to go somewhere. And I said no. And so there was a, another a pickup truck on the other side of the pump. And there was, I could see in there two little children, little blonde haired heads sticking out. They were little. Um, and evidently the person that would put the gas in, who was their parent or whatever, had gone in to pay. And so I saw this guy, when I said no, then I just finished pumping and got in. Well, my kids were crying when I got in the car because this scary man. And uh, and how old were they? Well, they, uh, I, they, were, they were six and eight. Okay. Yeah. So they were little. Yeah. And so, uh, so then he went around to this pickup truck with his little kids in it, and I saw him look in like he was checking to see if the key was in the ignition, which it evidently was. And by this time now, I'm sitting back in the car, and my kids are crying, saying, "Don't, Mom, don't leave us in the car. You know, bring us in, because that scary guy. And I said, don't worry, I would never leave you. So then I'm sitting there behind the steering wheel, waiting, watching this guy. And he tried to open the door to get in. Of whose car? The, the pickup with okay. the kids. And so I, um, I, when he did, I stood up and out of my car and I just stared at him. And then he looked down and then he went around and walked a little bit, then he came back and like I say, evidently Second the keys try. were in. Well, he did it three times. Oh. He tried to get in and every time I'd get back up out of the car and just glare at him. And so um, he left, finally he took off in the ditch. And anyway, the people came out and the person that was driving and I told them about it and it, that's irrelevant. But what happened was the kids were so shook up. so. So after after they uh, after they left and uh, we went in to pay, I got the kids a candy bar. They were so upset that they couldn't even eat their candy bars, which is very wow. unusual. Um, kids and, can always eat. Yeah, candy. right. And so uh, the, my six-year-old said, uh, "Mom, and that was so uh, that man." That bad man, because he was only little, six, and he, that bad man, when I looked at him, he had lines of red devils holding hands that went strip, strips of them all ah. through his body. And I said, really? Well, I believe it because a little kid doesn't make stuff up like that. Right. And uh, they were shaken, visibly shaken. Well, anyway, so we drove home and they were pretty upset all the way home, especially my daughter. And, and I tucked the kids into bed that night. Uh, you know, prayed with them, and we had our little <clears throat> ritual of uh, good night pro process. <laughs> and I, I said, God, you know, um, I, I think it's wonderful. I mean, I'm thankful for everything, but I'm just curious about why you would let a six-year-old child see demons. Right. And you know, and God, you're sovereign, and I'm not arguing or anything. I'm just curious. Not being critical, but no, why but, did you do it? Yeah. <laughs> It seemed like it was so scary. So, uh, I, I, no answer. So I'm telling my, I'm relaying the whole message to my friend. We were having coffee and about this terrifying, upsetting ordeal we had the night before. And uh, I said, you know, the only thing that I wonder about was why would God allow a six-year-old to see these demons? Yeah. And um, he was at that time sitting on the kitchen floor listening to us talk, and he's playing, playing with his cars, probably lining up cars and trucks, and that. <laughs> you don't even think the kids are listening, right? But he was listening, and when I said that, he said, "Yeah, mom, I was really afraid, but then when I saw the 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 big ladder with the angels on it, 
But then I wasn't afraid anymore. And I'm like, what? Why didn't you tell me that? What? Yeah, what was the and, ladder with the angels? Yeah, and I said, ladder saw. with the angels? What do you mean? And he said, well, the guy was right by you and talking to you. And then all of a sudden, and I was really scared of what he was going to do because I saw these red demon things. And he said, or he didn't call them that, bad things, yeah. you know. Um, he didn't say the word demon and then but he said but then all of a sudden there was the big ladder a giant ladder with angels going up and down and up uh, and down the ladder that was right between you and him so that I wasn't afraid anymore. Wow. and so right between you and the, the, and the creepy guy. guy yeah the bad guy and uh, yeah so I mean it was God's protection it was his wow. total protection and it did involve angels I did not see them myself yeah but, but the six-year-old boy the six did. The six-year-old did, and, you know, that's something you never forget. And it was such a story of protection for me. Not only were we there and protecting, our, my presence there was stopping him from taking off. With, uh, Kidnapping those, those other yeah. two children. Yeah. So that was a, a, a real, something I've never forgotten because I know that God is with me. And... Um, and He's, and guarding the kids. And guarding the kids. And yet, Ryan, He's a good my son, God. learned... Uh, a lesson at that time that I'm sure he still, you know, was embedded in his heart. Oh. Well, our nephew, Sean, was probably four years old when he was riding in the car with you along well, the highway. Actually, yeah, he was more like seven. He was seven. And I had an old car. We were on our way to the city, which was quite a jaunt from where we lived, and it was a big deal. I was taking him back home even, spending time with us, and he was, like I say, he was about seven. And uh, he... We had no air conditioning. I had this old car, and I always wondered if I'd go on this trip, am I going to make it back without any problems? It was one of those, <laughs> it was a hoopty, a ghetto cruiser. Um, but anyway, so we had no air conditioning, so we had the 480. We had to use 480 method that day. What would that be? Uh, all four windows down and going 80 miles an hour. No. <laughs> I didn't really go 80. For the air. Yeah, for, to cool us down. Well, anyway, because he's got the window down, he's like this in the back seat. He's looking out the window, and he puts his head back in the car and said, Auntie D, there's a great big angel out there running alongside of the car, and his head is way up like by the clouds. Wow. Well, like I said before, little kids don't make this stuff up. No. Well, I knew I was going to make my trip safely that day because I had an angel <laughs> running. <laughs> wow. So that you know, was people think sometimes that angels are these little things that look like cupids. Yeah. You know, they're little tiny things. They're powerless. Yeah, they're just kind of cutesy. Yeah. Not so. Not Angels so. come in all sizes, yeah. and and they have different purposes. Right. And in the 1800s, there was a man who was a miss missionary. He and his wife were in uh, a South American uh, country, and uh, they had the enemies there of the the village, the tribal people, wanted them dead and out of there. Mm. And so the one night, it's just the husband and wife, and the one night, uh, he, uh, they were out there. And they were gonna. They had their torches, and they were gonna burn their place down. Wow! And so he and his wife obviously were at prayer and deep in prayer, and um, they sensed the danger. Yeah. Well, they saw him. Okay. They saw him. They're out there to kill us. They're ready to wow. burn us. Burn us out. And uh, so they pray, spent most of the night praying. And when they f looked out in the daylight, all those men were gone. Hmm. Huh. And so they thank God for keeping them safe through the night. And about a year later, the chief of that tribe got saved. And so the missionary said, you know, let me ask you about something. When you were out there that night, he goes, well, we were out there because we were going to burn you, burn you out. Burn, mm. And we wanted you dead. And he said, well, why did, what stopped you? And he said, well, you had all those men there circled around your house. <laughs> Big, tall men with shiny outfits on and swords. Wow. Now, don't think the angels are always some little cherub with a grin on their face like you, you're talking Mighty about. Mighty warriors. They're, uh, can you see if they have a sword and they're out there and protecting? I bet they're like this, <sighs> vicious. And uh, I know that's true. They scared all those tribal people. They were afraid to attack. And so... That it, reminds me of the scripture verse. The angel of the Lord encampeth around those that fear him. Yeah, I think Isn't it's it verse so? 7 or 8. Yeah, and so that is true. If you love him and, uh, and are depending on him and asking him for help, he can send help and he will keep you. We have his promises to stand on. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. Right.
Well, I want to thank you for listening today, and I want to thank my guest, D. Tanner, <laughs> and uh, I appreciate it so much, and let's uh, talk more about this another time. I'd be glad to. I want some angelic encounters to yes. share. Yes. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.